Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time this summer off and on looking at the Gospel of Mark. And I hope and pray that you'll enjoy it and find some, some good uh, life lessons in it as we go through it. Now, Mark is the shortest of our four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And some of you know that the Gospel of Mark is full of action and very short on theological discourses. Uh, we don't get, like we did last week when we looked at the third chapter of the Gospel of John, uh, an entire chapter devoted to Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Uh, we don't get in Mark, like we do in Matthew and Luke, a long genealogy of Jesus. Mark bursts out of the gate at full speed and never lets up. The first chapter of Mark includes the ministry of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus, the temptation in the wilderness, the calling of the disciples, casting out demons, healing Peter's mother-in-law, healing a leper, all in the first chapter. Chapter 2 has the Pharisees coming and complaining that Jesus doesn't keep the Sabbath and also has some more healings. And then in the third chapter, which Joe read for us today, we have the story of those who are opposed to Jesus. There's opposition already by the third chapter. And this opposition comes from two fronts. And one we probably would expect, the other not so much. We would expect that the scribes coming from Jerusalem might have something to say about this backwater Galilean preacher. But we're probably shocked that his own family seems worried about him. And maybe even more shocked at Jesus' response to that. His family had heard some of the stories people were telling about Jesus and that there were some people who told the family that Jesus has gone out of his mind. That was their interpretation of Jesus. And so his family comes to check him out. They're worried about him. Jesus is told that his mother and his brothers and his sisters have come for him and asking about him. And he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? And then he looks around the crowd there and says, these are my mothers and brothers and sisters. For anyone who does the will of God is my family. Now, I assume that you, maybe even like me, are bothered by some of that. After all, we value our families, right? They give us a sense of who we are. They're the people that we belong to. Family systems in Jesus' day established a person's identity, established their status in life, often even dictated what occupation they would go into. But Jesus calls for a radical definition of family. Just having a family name doesn't define who you are. There's something more important, doing the will of God. He said basically the same thing later on to the man who wanted to follow Jesus, but said that he needed to bury his father first. But Jesus, from the cross, you have to remember, did value family when he told his disciple John to take care of his mother. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. So Jesus did care. But he knew that he was called 
to a higher purpose than just running the family business or carrying on the family name. He was, as that famous line puts it from the movie The Blues Brothers, on a mission for God. United Methodist Bishop Will Williman makes this statement concerning this scripture, quote, to be fair, Jesus seems no more antip ant against <laughs> the family than he is against money or success or government officials or religious authorities. In Jesus, everything is subordinated to his mission. Nothing is more important than obedience to his Father's will. Still, isn't it interesting that Jesus appears to devalue what we consider so valuable, unquote. That's a pretty thought-provoking question, Bishop. But then the scribes come from Jerusalem, and their critique of Jesus is scathing. Look at this Jesus, healing the sick, raising the dead, performing miracles, preaching that people should love God and also love their neighbors. Yep, he must be possessed by a demon. And not just any demon, but Beelzebul, the chief demon. Don't show me any evidence to the contrary. Our minds are made up. He's only trying to trick us into believing he comes from God. Even today, right, we have people demonizing their enemies, their opponents. This isn't anything new. There are those who, despite the evidence of their own eyes, believe the lie. The attack on the Capitol on January 6th, that was just a group of tourists. The scribes had their alternate facts. And Jesus wasn't part of their group and therefore, he must be wrong. That's the premise that they started from. And no amount of persuading them otherwise was going to convince them. They didn't stop to engage Jesus in conversation to see if their premise might be wrong. Instead, they blurt out this accusation. He has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. In their religious blindness, the scribes could not see what Jesus has made so logically obvious. His work was of God. The scribes began with the assumption that Jesus was doing evil rather than doing good. They could have assumed that he was doing good until proven otherwise, but they didn't. And that was their blindness. And we all have our own areas of blindness. You may be familiar with the concept of confirmation bias. That's the tendency we have to favor information that confirms, conforms to our previously existing beliefs or biases. And researchers have shown that we all have this tendency. For instance, if we think that left-handed people are more creative than right-handed people, we will latch on to any of those stories that seems to emphasize the creativity of left-handed people while at the same time discounting any stories of creative right-handed people. Now that's sort of a silly example, but I hope you see what I'm getting at. If we think that Republicans are just out to destroy our democracy, we will discount stories of Republicans who are fighting for democracy. And if we hear or read news stories about Republicans' attempts to limit democracy will say, see, that just goes to show you that they're evil. The Democrats also get hammered too. I hear people say, Democrats just want to create a godless communistic society. 
I, I probably spend too much time on Facebook, but I see that sort of logic all the time there. And you probably see it when you watch the evening news, too, regardless of what channel you might watch. Because the scribes thought Jesus cast out demons because he was in league with the chief of demons, then every time Jesus casts out a demon, it only confirms their existing confirmation bias. The bias we have to think evil of someone who is different than us. Or the demon of thinking anyone who is hungry or homeless is just lazy. Or the demon that tells us that blacks or Latinos are inferior to whites. The demon could be disease. It could be ideologies that oppress and tyrannize or political oppression. Demons can be abuse or violence misogyny, a whole host of forces. We can counteract the effects, some of those effects of our own confirmation bias by not jumping to conclusions. That was sort of the point of the pepper and the, and the dishwashing soap there. Don't jump to those conclusions. Take your time to do the research. Check your sources. If we know about confirmation bias, if we accept that that is probably a reality even in our own lives, then we can make an effort to recognize it by working to be curious about opposing views and really listening to what others say and why they say it. That can help us better see issues and beliefs from another perspective. We may not change our mind about a particular issue, but we might be able to understand where the other person is coming from and not so readily label them as inferior to us. We can maybe truly begin to see the whole picture. I pray that that might be so. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we confess that sometimes we jump to conclusions, we judge someone before we've even asked what's really going on. Help us, Lord, to do better. Forgive us. May we have ears to hear. May we have hearts to be open to others. Thank you for giving us convictions and thank you for giving us uh, the ideals that we hold personally, but also help us not to demonize others. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.